Hey there, really quick before we dive into today's podcast, would you do us a favor and rate and share this podcast? That would help us out tremendously for blowing this thing up. We're not really big on asking for these types of things, but we really want to expand and be able to bring on more cool people like today's guest. If you can take a minute, it only takes a minute, that would be great. All right, let's get to it. Welcome to The Producer Mindset, where we interview industry leaders about entrepreneurship, marketing, business development, and overall what it takes to run a successful business in, but not exclusive to, the real estate industry in today's age. Dave Savage is the founder and chief innovation officer of Mortgage Coach. He has over 27 years of experience as a mortgage executive, business leader, and mobile technology pioneer. As the founder of Smart Reply, Dave established the leading presence in mobile marketing, by launching Mortgage Coach. Dave has helped tens of thousands of loan officers and millions of homeowners make confident, informed mortgage decisions. Dave is passionate about leveraging mobile technology to reinvent the home buying experience. Dave is a recognized leader in the mortgage industry for his contributions to improving the professionalism and quality of advice that mortgage originators provide homeowners. As a mortgage industry leader, Dave has been a speaker at many major industry events. And before Mortgage Coach, Dave was one of the nation's top loan originators and president of a national mortgage company. Without further ado, here is Dave Savage. Hey, guys. What's going on? What's going on? on? So this is great. So Dave, the first question that we ask everybody that comes on the producer mindset is, one day you were born. Now you're here with us on the podcast. Fill us out on what happened in between those two timeframes. And we can go ahead and just keep it pre-mortgage coach for now. And then we can dive into um, your mortgage coach career after that. Wow. Pre-born and and now. But I guess so you... So you want to hear some stories of the pre-business guy era? Yeah, just, you know, you were born, uh, where you grew up, how, how, what got you into the mortgage space, the mortgage world, uh, what happened before Mortgage Coach? Because a lot of people know you for Mortgage Coach, um, but I know you had a life before that. All right. So I'll, I'll end this version just with my mortgage story. I'll try to keep it as short as I can. So, so I was born in Denver, Colorado. Uh, my dad was going to DU, like my two grandpas before him, you know, they all have MBAs. They were all, you know, good students and, and, uh, and enjoyed school, unlike me. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, and I, I, I hear that I was a handful of a kid, you know, like always smiling, always busy, always got up early before everybody else and always messed up stuff around the house so as I've heard they've got some pretty funny pictures with me of you know like pouring pancakes right up on my head and <laughs> doing all kinds of wacky things you know I guess I learned how to get out of my crib pretty early in day so I'm told and my favorite toy so I'm told was a, a broom you know I used to carry a broom everywhere I went <laughs> uh, so FYI uh, and then I, I was never a good student, you know, like I, uh, I was a good athlete. I love sports. I loved, you know, I made friends. I loved, you know, making friends and building relationships was my favorite thing to do. And I, and I was friends with all the different kid groups, you know, I mean, you didn't really have clicks and kid groups as much. I mean, you had kind of the cool kids and the not so cool kids, but, and you had the athletes, but then I went to high school in Huntington Beach, California, and it was like, the new roads, you know, the, the, you know, the punkers, the surfers, the reggae, the, you know, just all these different, you know, cliques and groups. And I was friends with all of them. So I was always just very, I was a jock, you know, so I did, and I, I don't think I would have graduated from high school if I wasn't a pretty good athlete. Uh, and, and that even kept me in school. I, I was diagnosed in third grade with ADD and dyslexia. And, and, and back in my days, you know, they were not humane about it. Like I literally had to walk up to the front of the class and take a pill. And I think every kid in the class knew I'm taking, wow. Dave's taking his hyper pills, uh, you know, crazy savage. And, and uh, that was tough. I actually didn't know how much that, I don't know. I had issues over that until Amplify 
uh, you know, Renee, um, anybody who's ever been to Amplify that's heard this, uh, he'll, first of all, when I did my first presentation, he said, you can't say the word mortgage coach at any time. And I went there so that I could tell the mortgage coach story better and present as a mortgage coach better. Like that was my why I went yeah. to Amplify. And he's like, Dave, we don't want to hear about mortgage coach. And he just kept going, why, why? And, and actually when I told the story about, you know, ADD and taking Redlin, I actually cried, you know, like it was, it was, it was intense, but so there's that. And then college was tough. I am, um, I was grinding it out, you know, just because that's what my dad did. That's what my grandpa did. That was what I thought, you know, I want to be successful. I needed to do. Uh, and, but I wasn't doing good. I mean, I was on, I wasn't even on the four-year plan, you know, I, I mean, excuse me, I wasn't on the five-year plan. I was probably on the eight-year plan. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so I was, but I, but I was going to finish it. You know, I had actually had a vision that I wanted to go to USC and do the entrepreneurship program. It was, I think it was the second year USC had an entrepreneurship program and that fired me up. Like I was like, Oh, USC entrepreneurship program. I'm going to get good enough grades to get into that, you know, and if my parents won't pay for it, I'll get a student loan. And so I, I had, um, and then I, I actually did have a year of, you know, B's and A's and um, quit being a, I, I did, I was at Huntington Beach during the punk rock era. So, you know, I was, I guess a, I wasn't a punker, you know, like I didn't get tattoos, but I did have the spiky hair and I did go to a lot of, uh, you know, I've been to countless live music gigs in my life and still love live music. In fact, I'm going to a rush, um, a, a, it's not, we, in high school, there was a group of us that loved rush. And so we're going to a, what, what do you call it? Like, it's not rush. It's a cover band. We're going to a rush gotcha. cover band with a bunch of high school buddies tonight. So that's, that's not, so I have a rush shirt on. FYI. Uh, okay. So, so finding the mortgage business was, absolutely the best thing that ever happened to my life because I, you know, wasn't excelling in school. I did not have any purpose. I had decided I wanted to make a lot of money. That's a whole other story, but I, one of my best friends, Mark Brooks, dad drove a Ferrari and I got a little taste of driving in a Ferrari, hanging out with rich people, going to big houses. And I'm like, this is, you know, this is, this is where it's at. Like, I want to figure that out. And, and I had actually, I was working at Smart and Final because I had to pay my way through college. So I was working at Smart and Final, hard work, you know, like graveyard, um, pretty good pay for the time. You know, I was making more than a lot of my friends, but I was going to Smart and Final, working graveyard shifts sometimes, this going to school, hating that, and then partying all hours of the day. And, and then I went to happy hour, best happy hour went to um, guy I worked with by the name of Jim Garten, who's also a high school football buddy. And I go, he's like, what are you doing? I go, what are you doing? I, I'm going to happy hour with, you know, Sandy was his girlfriend and Dory was an S was a, a loan processor and, and her, her boss is buying drinks. You want to come? I'm like, yeah, sounds good to me. And, and Dory's boss drives up Mel Samick. Mercedes Benz, you know, so at that stage in life, the guy had a Mercedes Benz, he's a rich dude. And I'm, you know, and he was just nice, like, hi, oh, I'm Mel, you know, no pretension, just like literally one of the nicest people I ever met, bought drinks, but it wasn't like baller buying drinks. He was just like, you know, taking care of his work crew and I right. happened to be with him. And, right. and I'm like, I, and I had saved up enough money. I think I made $14,000 a year at smart and final and i had saved up enough money where i couldn't just pay off college but i had saved money and um and so i i'm like you know what i don't care how much money i want make i want to work for mel like and i had asked like what does he do oh he helps loan people money and i'm like oh these guys driving a ferrari are builders and they have lots of money i need lots of money i need to learn how to borrow money and this guy who drives a mercedes loans people money and I don't know exactly what I said when I called him the next day, but I, I think it, it it was like, I'll work for free. I don't know what you do, but I just want to learn what you do. And I don't think I actually said I'd work for free, but I was wearing that vibe. Right. And he, he hired me. And uh, so many 
lessons in life, like literally in the first three months, I'm going to rattle off some things that happened that changed me forever. So, so first he's, he, he hired me and he said, show up at my house at seven in the morning. And I'm like, no problem. Cause I'm an early riser. You know, that's not a test. I'll be there. And I've always been prompt and early. So that's like, you know, I was at his house waiting outside at 645. Cause that's just how I have always rolled. Mm -hmm. And, um, and he's like, we, you gotta, you know, you gotta learn every day. And I was kind of like, oh shit, that means I gotta read. I'm ADD, I'm dyslexic, I hate reading. And uh, he didn't even put a book in front of me. He, he, it was Tommy Hopkins, it was books on tape. And, he, and it was just like, and I didn't even know that books on tape existed. Like that was like, what? You know, I can learn how to sell and I don't have to read anything. And I, I fell in love with learning, you know, like I, and, and that was part of what I had to do to work for Mel is I had to um, spend an hour every day um, listening or reading. And, and I actually did. I fell so in love with learning how to sell and learning business that I actually started reading books and, and I still mm -hmm. read books. I, I like to listen more because for me to comprehend a book, it's it's harder than for most people. So mm -hmm. now like my process to really consume a piece of content is I'll usually, before I read a book, listen to a podcast by the author or find some audio content and I go, okay. And then and then I'll, I'll buy the book. This is yep. the book I'm getting ready to read. And I love Ed Milet. I mean, yeah, I, he's like, great. I, like, I like his interviews and his content. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, and, and I'll actually like, I'll buy a lot of books just for the ideas, but, but now like I'll listen to it, I'll read it and I'll kind of do all three of those things to really master content. But that without Mel Samick, Mel, if you hear this, thank you, brother. Uh, that was gift number one for Mel. And, and then um, gift number two, he, my first day at work, he handed me the yellow pages. You guys probably don't know what that is, but it, it's a thing that we used to use before the internet. Mm -hmm. all these businesses and he opened it up to cpas and he goes here's the script uh my name is dave savage with excalibur mortgage we specialize in helping cpas and their clients with their real estate financing needs do you ever have a client that has questions or has needs around real estate financing like that was it 100 times a day you know that was like 36 years ago and i can still say that script like the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, <laughs> something better than the Pledge of Allegiance. And, and when I'd get a hot one, I'd like, no, no, this guy has needs and questions. So what do we do? You know? And, <laughs> and so within, within three months, I made $10,000 in a single month, you know, wow. and it was just, you know, like eyes and, wide open. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, uh, I quit school. I'm like, I found what I'm supposed to do and I can make more money than my dad. And uh, I love it. I'm game on. Laura was just like, no school. Hell yes. That's Quit smart and final. Bought a BMW. And I think three months later, I was broke and I had $10,000 in credit card debt. Uh, and I... Uh, I, and I think I made like 60 or 70 grand my first year. And so the first, one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about financial literacy is I, even though my dad was a CPA and an MBA and my grandpa was, it'd be a longer story and I'd be more of a therapy session to go down this road, but I didn't get financial literacy for my family. And, uh, and I definitely did not act responsibly with money for the first three to five years of making a lot of money. I mean, I, I, I made over a hundred thousand dollars, you know, my, I think 60,000 my first year, 120,000 my next year, and literally doubled my income every year until a million dollars in, in annual income in the mortgage business. So, you know, do the math. What was that like six right. years, um, five years. And so that's it, man. So that's, I think I, I laid it up to the mortgage, yeah. you know, told you about my youth a little bit and gave you my mortgage story. That's amazing. So a lot of stuff to unravel there, right? Um, I love the, I mean, the one thing that really sticks out, obviously mentors, like the main thing that we want, like a main common thread that we've kind of noticed with anyone that we've talked to is there's been one or two key people that kind of opened their eyes to a better 
a better um, way of doing things or a better career path or some sort of shift. So that's really cool to see that Mel was that person for you. And then the whole um, ADD thing, I feel like, you know, so many hyper successful people that I personally listen to, they have ADD. And uh, the one person that I really feel like nailed it, nailed it on the head with the definition of it is Dan Sullivan with strategic coach. He says that it it's just the inability to focus on something that you're not interested in. And I feel like that's so cool. Like you found something that you're, you're truly passionate about and somebody gave it to you in a way that you're able to consume it. And then that just started the fire underneath you for your originating career. So I think that's really, really cool. Um, going, going into mortgage coach a little bit. So you, as you talked about financial literacy and how that's something that, you know, you, you weren't really raised with, and is, is that kind of the, the, the premise for mortgage coach? Is that the gap that you felt was, was missing, um, in, in home buyers or how, how did mortgage coach come about? What was the, what was the beginning of that? So I, I would love to say that I was altruistic and, you know, was this mission driven, but I was a sales animal, you know, I had like, it was all about conversion and I had landed on this value proposition that my advice makes a difference, you know, and, and I did like numbers. Like I, I was, I was very good in math, you know, so like I was in like eighth grade, I had probably third grade spelling and writing skills and I had college level math skills. So I was always um, got A's in math and crushed it in math and loved numbers. So I, I, I would say my advice makes a difference. Ask some strategic questions. How old do you want to be when your home's paid off? You know, how long do you have the mortgage? But then it would be like to be able to give this presentation to the consumer. Uh, and it was pre-mortgage coach. And, you know, I was using Excel spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. I adopted computers very early because spell check. You know, I, I knew that, you know, intuitively in business, I think I learned it from Harvey McKay. Uh, reading one of his books that like, hey, if you meet with someone and you organize, you know, you had a Rolodex and you send handwritten notes, I couldn't send handwritten notes, but you know what? I could use a computer, I could use spell check and I could send a note. Uh, yeah. And so, so when I created Mortgage Coach, it was just a sales tool to create systematic, consistent wow in the mind of the consumer. And in fact, when I when I finally decided that, hey, I'm going to put some money behind this and partnered with Greg and let's create Mortgage Coach, we created Wow Tools. You know, that was the name of the company was Wow Tools. Uh, and it was only probably two months before I was on stage at Todd Duncan selling Mortgage Coach for the first time that we decided to call it Mortgage Coach. You know, like we, wow. we, we, it was between Mortgage Planner. We, we, we got mortgageplanner.com. We had mortgagecoach.com. And I spent a month kind of like, should it be mortgageplanner.com? Should it be mortgage coach? And, and we went to market with mortgage coach, you know. Uh, and by the way, it's 25 years ago, um, August 20, or like last month. Uh, and this year at Sales Mastery, it'll be the 30th anniversary of Sales Mastery. And it will be the 25th anniversary of mortgage coach. Wow. That's really cool. I want to I want to touch on that really quickly because you were between mortgage planner and mortgage coach. Clearly mortgage coach stuck around and it is what it is today and I think at least from just having been around you or watching your content and just kind of like in the conversation here and there right. One of the things that I've noticed is the the term coach really like now with media starting to like take off and off of mortgage coach, just being able to provide a sales tool, but not just providing a sales tool to, I would say the, the originator, but more than anything, develop other industry leaders with that in mind. Like how did mortgage coach the title play out then? Like, did you think it was going to be what it is today? And where are you at now with the different leaders within mortgage coach that I see like developing other future yeah. like originators and everything like what's that like well there's i think there's two questions there that i'll try to answer both of them so i mean mortgage coach beat mortgage planner for me because i started thinking about planners help someone make a decision and i also started thinking like planners financial planners 
CPAs and I and coaches. Coaches help you make good decisions and then they help you make that decision right over time. And and then I, you know I was pretty good in sports and a lot of important mentors to me were coaches. You know those were always people that I at that stage of my life that I looked up to the most was coaches. Like I want to be a coach uh, more than I want to be a planner. Uh, and by the way, I'm not a very good planner, you know, so, so it was just kind of like, okay, I'm a planner, I'm a much better coach. So mortgage coach beats uh, mortgage planners was the thesis. And, and so, you know, went, went to market with that. Um, so I, I, I felt like that was part one of the question. What was part two of the question? Just like, I mean, all this time years later, right? Like, well, do I, I think it would be a big thing like this? So yeah, absolutely not. Like I, this, you know, first of all, the word SaaS wasn't around, you know, this was, I don't know if it was pre-internet, we'll have to look at the date of the internet, but I mean, the internet was not a big deal, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, technology had just come out. Like, I think you guys have seen that picture of me in 1992. LinkedIn, yeah. You know, like that, well, that was five years before I founded Mortgage Coach, so computers had evolved a little bit, but, but the word SaaS, software as a service, didn't exist, and there wasn't like, you know, all the stories of rock star tech people um, doing what they did. So my thesis was I wanted to build it. I did want to build, be the number one loan officer in the country. And I did want to build the most profitable, most successful mortgage company in the country. And I was building it as a competitive advantage. And then financially, I was like, because we actually were very early, like before anyone charged an annual renewal, like when we sold it from stage at Sales Mastery for the first time, it was $9.95 and a $95 annual fee. And I was thinking like, okay, that $9.95 is like a nice kick. And we were discounting it. Like I think not too many people paid more than $6.95. So we wanted to, you know, have a sense of urgency. It costs this, buy it today, get it for this. But that $99 a month, I'm like, hey, if I could get thousand people it would just be like a retirement account it, I, you know it's kind of like greg and i were figuring out how much money would we need in the bank to do x and and then it you know we did raise the price to 195 a month and then we did get an ambition to have well now that we've got a thousand let's get five thousand but it was it was like it was like working it was like a side gig retirement account that fueled the competitive advantage for me as a mortgage operator. Wow. That's, That's a amazing. nice little side gig, huh? Yeah. <laughs> my, wife, my, wife, my wife was a pretty successful real estate agent at the time. And, and she sold the first um, 500 mortgage coaches out of, you know, her real estate desk. You know, people would call and was like, hey, is this that software that Dave Savage uses? You know, and that, you know, because I, talked at sales mastery and had started building a reputation of this, you know, innovative, young, successful loan officer. Is this that software that Tim Brahim uses? Is this that software that Jim McQuaig uses? And, and by the way, that was my strategy for a long time where I, you know, people like Jim McQuaig, your dad, people like Barry Habib, Jim McMahon, Stephen Marshall. I mean, any really well-known, you know, pre-meltdown top producing loan officer, they did use mortgage coach. Like it was, it was all of our superpowers. And then they would just, every time they talked on stage, they would tell about it. And then my wife, Kelly, would get a call. Yeah. Give me your credit card. And I'll send it out. That exit. That's really cool. That's amazing. So that's, that's really cool. I, so when, so obviously you've been, you've had a, a knack for innovating and disrupting and just, you know, ultimately giving really good, you know, providing service, right? Um, fast forward to when social media started kind of becoming relevant and people started seeing it less as a, um, something that was going to just kind of be here one day and gone the next. Um, and that shift to like, wow, I can use this to put my message in front of people that need it the most. When did you, was there a specific moment or a time where you're like, wow, this is a really great tool to use to get my message, the mortgage coach message in front of different loan originators or different, um, you know, real so estate there, professionals. There's kind of two parts to that. So I, I did truly fall in love with 
Instagram. Like if you go and stalk me and look at my first post and you look at the the date when Instagram was founded, I mean, I, I don't, I think it might be the first month, you know, definitely not more than three months. And I, and I, I was a photography minor in high school and college and I loved photography. So when Instagram came out, I was just like, shit, you know, like, why didn't I think of that? You know, and, uh, you know, like take pictures, make them look cool. Now, this was before Instagram became a thing, you know, like like the whole sharing of it. Um, I don't remember where Facebook was at that point, and I, and I don't think I was on it. Um, and it definitely wasn't using YouTube. Uh, but I mean, I was a very early adopter of, and if you look at my early, um, you know, my first, I don't know, 50 to a hundred Instagrams, it was just like a dad who would take pictures of his family. And it was for me, like, yeah, I did not do those for anyone but myself. Like this was like, oh, cool, free way to store a photo digitally and put a little cool effect on it. You know, like for me and my family, Yeah, you know, I, we call our family the core four. And so I was doing that for my kids, for my wife, for me. And I still, while I, I do put a little business stuff in it like now it is me mortgage coach chief innovation officer mortgage coach and sales boomerang but it's still like for me you know like i i still do instagram first for me like oh i want to say that i want to remember that mm -hmm. like it, i really don't do it with the intent I, I need i think i need to evolve a little bit on that so that that's that and then really the you know the way i really got into um youtube was because it was a free way to publish and store a video and share it. And I, coming out of the meltdown, I uh, started doing the Tuesday interview where I'd interview a top producer. <clears throat> and that was the meltdown completely crushed our business. You know, we, I mean, we didn't get come close to coming out of business, but I mean, I went from almost 20,000 users and 37 employees to like 12 employees and, a thousand users and and it was a, we lost a lot and and my thesis when i started doing those tuesday interviews was that hey i've got some of the best loan officers in the country that use mortgage coach they're loyal to it you know and i'm pretty good too well i used to be a pretty good loan officer so i really know the mortgage business you know what i'm going to do the best sales meeting in the mortgage industry every tuesday at nine o'clock and with my network of friends slash clients, there won't be a better sales meeting in the mortgage industry. And, and, and the meltdown, you know, really put everybody on their heels. So there wasn't a lot of leadership taking place. They were craving and, the content that you were providing, right? It was perfect timing for that. Yeah. So now YouTube was kind of, oh, let's have a place that's free that we could store them. You know, that was really it because people was, oh, I want to see the recording. And we use GoToMeeting, you know. I think people still use GoToMeeting. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so, it, But yeah, we used GoToMeeting to record it. And it was more of a live audience. And that was how most people consumed that best sales meeting in the industry every Tuesday at nine. And YouTube was just like, oh, let's, let's just, you know, save money and have it there. It wasn't like a big strategy. Um, but it did evolve. I mean, I, I you know, one, I loved it, like doing interviews like this. And when I'm interviewing someone, it's it's literally the only time that my mind is at peace. I'm totally into you. I have no instinct to pick up my phone and do that. And so it was it was just something that I could do to, you know, to to be present and slow down my mind. And and then I I love to learn, you know, so I uh I Mel ignited like ignited that. Like I probably if I if they would have had audiobooks in school, I probably would have been an incredible student. Mm -hmm. because I, I didn't know that I loved to learn because I hated school so much. <laughs> but once I found audiobooks and I was learning about selling and marketing and business and things that I wanted to, um, you know, I I became, you know, an A plus student. And with, with that in mind and just the ability to, I mean, this was was this around like are you talking about like 2008 2009 is that is that the time frame we're talking about here let's let's, let's we go into our youtube and see when that started i know that started after um 
Instagram, but I mean, Instagram was me as a social media person. Gotcha. Right. Because uh, what, what I want to know, and the reason why I asked this question is because right now, I mean, one of the, one of the. So, so, so I joined um, YouTube in June 6th of 2011. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's when so I started YouTube channel. 11 years in, um, you know, like right now, one of the hot topics that we keep hearing in the industry in general is like the market, the market, this, the market, that interest rates, interest rates. What would you say, having gone through that and obviously finding a way to not just ease your mind and capitalize on your relationships, your friendships in order to provide more value to people within the industry, what would you say is the biggest gap of whether it be information or I would say information or education that it, that's preventing some of these new loan officers and even loan officers that have been doing it from legitimately like growing their business and becoming successful? Well, I mean, I'm going to start with just because of the, I've done a lot. I do interviews every, every week, you know, not every day, but at least three interviews a week. And I, and I've done that for over five years and I've done at least one interview a week for, you know, over 15 years uh, and put that on social media. And, and, but, but in the past month, I've interviewed two loan officers that are actually up. Their production is up. Uh, Denise Donahue, who did 700 loans in 2021, is up. She's going to do more business this year. Uh, Nicole Ruth, who did 400, no, 309 million in production last year. She's up 4.6%. She's up. Wow. And, and, and you know what they both have in common? They're using social media. They're creating content. They interview local leaders they they are teaching realtors how to sell homes in this market at scale uh and 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 so you know first I, i'll just say that you know there was a time and there was there was a considerable amount of time when i wasn't interviewing loan officers or using social media it, i mean it took years you know where there were like the ballers who, and to me anybody that does over 100 loans a year is a baller and obviously if you do two 300 loans a year you know now you're like franchise player. And, and then of course, every once in a while, you know, you get the shop Venotians that, you know, they built businesses, but it took a long time there. You know, there were a lot of social media loan officers, but they weren't doing business, you know, and I wouldn't interview them, but because that that's so far gone, like, like now social media is, it's how people learn. I mean, my, I could go on and on about all the things that my, Kids learn to do skills they built through YouTube. Uh, while I'm not a big TikToker, uh, the financial literacy training and the content in both Instagram and TikTok, it's real. Like, like it's it's it is the future. It is now, uh, and I I just think uh, you know it's the people that are going to gain market share tomorrow are going to build personal brands and. They're going to use social media as a way to build their brand, to educate their marketplace. Now, getting to your point about not doing it, you know, so, I mean, it, it was really easy for me because I can't spell and video is a way that I can communicate and not have to worry about spell check. Uh, so I am wired to like fall in love with this thing. And, and, and so for people that have good written skills, and then, and then I've always been, my wife calls me sometimes Captain Oblivious because I'm just like, oh, I am who I am, I am who I am. I don't overthink how I look. I don't overthink how I sound. And if you like it, great. And if you don't, I, I don't even know. I don't even care. Right. You know? So I'm wired that way. And, and I know a lot of people, they're just not wired like that. They, you know, they really self-analyze. Uh, they, they have other skills to communicate. And then they end up analysis by paralysis uh not doing it and and then i also say it, it is like any skill it takes repetitions like you know the first time you you do a video you know it ain't good mm -hmm. uh, you know and i see some load off some videos and like everybody should do video but maybe you should do something else i don't know i'm kidding I, audio you know, do podcasts yeah, do audio but you know podcast. what i'm saying i mean but but you keep you do something enough times you get good at it so so i mean the reason they don't is 
you know, they're either not wired like the people that do, or they haven't got clear enough on a why, like I need to do this uh, and I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna get through the pain of change. And, and that's just human nature. I mean, that's just the way of the world. I love it. I love that. That's great. I, um, so I texted you beforehand about kind of four, four like trenches of, of topics that we wanted to talk about. I think we covered the first two, leveraging technology to provide an outstanding service, leveraging your personal brand to grow your business. And then the last two, which one thing that happened recently, the event, um, preparing your company for sale and recruiting and retaining key players. So <clears throat> these are selfish questions for us. <laughs> All good. And I feel like that it's going to be really, really good content. So preparing your company for sale, how, first off, from the beginning of Mortgage Coach, did you know that you wanted to ultimately sell? No, maybe no, not. No, for sure not. In fact, I, I missed a really big, heartbreaking opportunity to sell Mortgage Coach before the meltdown. Sig Anderman, the founder of Ellie Mae, offered to buy Mortgage Coach. It, it was a, you know, a life-changing amount of money. And, and, and at the time, he wanted to give me 50% stock in Ellie Mae. And Ellie Mae was valued at $100 million. And you know anyone who knows the Ellie Mae story and it became worth billions of dollars knows that you know I passed on a really big opportunity and then the meltdown came. So that's evidence of how much you know like the plan was not to sell. It was like this residual income business. Now, if I would have thought Ellie Mae was really worth 100 million at that time and it was gonna become worth billions. I mean, I seriously considered selling it just wasn't enough for me to do it at the time. But I, after that, I started going, ooh, one, I screwed up. Uh, that's a whole other story. But but I I did like, hey, I'm building a business and I do want to monetize this beyond my monthly and my annual income. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I but I still, I, I loved what I do so much. And and I, coming out of the meltdown, it would be another podcast. I don't want right, right. to, but I did develop this mission to change how people get into debt. And, 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 and I'll just really quick, I came up with, a, well, I didn't do it. We as a team came up with it, Joe Pertur, Greg Wexler, our team that, you know what? We wanna change how people get into debt. And when there's 2 million people a year getting a total cost analysis, we'll, we'll be at that point, that pivot of starting to really make social change. And, and I had formed this thesis in my head that until we get to that point, I'm not going to give the controlling interest to mortgage coach to some other company who just wants our revenue, our income, and a growth engine. Like, I'm going to own it, be the CEO, have a controlling interest until we get to that 2 million TCAs. Uh, and I had a social purpose bigger than my bank account around that number. Mm -hmm. Um, but that kind of, you know, but we, we didn't quite hit that number in 2000. I, well, we didn't hit it, but we were close enough that I was going to do a transaction, you know, and I hired an investment banker and then COVID happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and my goal wasn't sell it. And, and, and while I did, you know, share a very, you know, sell a majority interest in the business. I mean, I, I'm still like Mr. Mortgage Coach all yeah. in and still have a very healthy equity interest in the business and a, a board of director seat and an executive level decision maker. So I didn't sell it, but I did take chips off the table. Right, and, right, right. And, and there was really two things there. One, I felt I took the company where it needed to get to achieve that mission. And I got to a point where having a you know PE firm, having more resources like sales boomerang would actually accelerate and improve the chances of that mission coming true. Uh, and I was able to take some money off the table and achieve, uh, you know, some financial freedom. Uh, so it was just a combination of those two things was yeah. why, why then, why now? And I don't know if you have more questions around it, but yeah, well, no, like how it all came together. I, I want to ask something there. Do you feel like now there's like, a little bit more more time that you have to get, if anything, aligned more so with people that are like minded that believe in the mission of Mortgage Coach and really like help develop a, like a next generation of Dave Savages per se. 
technology and intelligence. And, and we've we've landed on this new category that we're creating called the borrower intelligence platform. So so if we're if we're successful three years from now, uh, you know, there's acronyms like CRM, everybody knows what that is, LOS, everybody knows what that is, POS, point of sale, everybody knows what that is, you know. Um, BIP, borrower intelligence platform, is a is a new category, and we're going to create that category. That's so cool! Wow, that is really cool. Oh my goodness, yeah, um, it is it is really cool. Just truly innovating. That's so cool. Um, <laughs> as far as like, so one of the main not I wouldn't say it's a problem, but it's an on, I feel like it's going to be an ongoing thing that's always at the top of our mind. It's making sure that we're getting the right people that are aligned with where we want to go as a company um, in the right seats and contributing to the overall mission and vision of where we want our company to go. So for Mortgage Coach, um, at what point were you like, wow, we have amazing culture. We have all the people that we need to get this thing to the moon. Like, what was that process like getting your the company to that point? And how is it kind of played out moving forward? Well, I mean, it's a new day. I mean, we're merging two companies right mm -hmm. now, which which is hard. You know, two companies that independently had incredible cultures, had a lot of the right people in the right seats, a lot of very high performing people, and we're trying to merge them. So let's let's save that conversation for next year. Um, because I don't know, you know, like I, we're, we're going to do it because we know how to do it and we've done it before, but we're, we're blending them together. Um, and it's, it's fun. It's, you know, so there's ups and downs within that process. As far as the mortgage coach story and creating this yeah. wow culture. So, so, you know, the fact that the name, the company name is wow tools, we have always embraced. Wow. Like that is a company core value. And, and and we we look at that core value from a lot of angles. Like that means we need to create products that help our customers create wow. That means we need to, as employees, with every in exchange we have with someone, whether we're selling to them, whether we're servicing them, whether we're supporting them and there's a problem, create wow. And I think anyone that's ever um, interacted with our support team, our sales team, there I, I get a lot of people saying, wow what great people you have. And, and that also goes for each other, you know, how we have exchanges with each other. It should be a wow in a positive way. Like that's a core, core value that we lived really well at Mortgage Coach and, uh, you know, the leadership team we had. Uh, I can't say every year for the, you know, 25 years of Mortgage Coach, we had a, a level five wow culture, you know, like we certainly didn't when we were going through the meltdown and we were laying people off and, and we certainly didn't, you know, in different phases of the company, but, but we definitely did, you know, the, the, you know, the years before we had the transaction, it was a beautiful wow culture. Mm -hmm. And I, I've always, as a, as a, as a leader, um, when we hire people, I always say that, Hey, we're a character first company. Like, like I, I'm always looking at someone's character before I'm looking at their skill Mm -hmm. their experience and their success. Now, I absolutely want winners that work hard, that are successful, but I want people that are just, and, and the word I used internally a lot, cool. Well, that's, you know, I liked them, they're a cool person. Uh, and so, you know, you, I didn't use it, but you could say cool first. Like, like we want to be working with a lot of people that are just cool people, mm -hmm. kick ass and, and are hungry. Uh, so, so, you know, that's, Hopefully, you know, my goal now, if I play this out well, or I shouldn't say I, we, executive team, Rich, yep. and all of us, is we're going to build a multi-billion dollar pick tech company that is going to have the coolest, you know, um, character first culture in fintech. And we're going to, you know, we're going to break a lot of business records in the process. That's, That's cool. really awesome. <clears throat> I have That's one cool. last question with the... With 25 years with Mortgage Coach, mind you, like this is not the kid that was being brought to the front of the class to like take this pill. <laughs> okay. Really? Um, so it's like, 
it's really incredible to see like just like that entire journey right because i feel like there it doesn't get talked enough about in business there seems to be at least for uh, the longest time there was a stigma but with that in mind how did you manage through the time with mortgage coach and now going into this new venture with sales boomerang and forward like in the fintech industry how do you manage yourself and even your team and the culture to not get the shiny object syndrome well that's that's actually hard and i i actually had I've been having some self talk the past couple of days with myself I'm a little out of control at the moment, you know, with uh, saying yes to too many things. I, I need to get more focus. So I, I, I think, I mean, for me personally, that's a constant struggle. Now I can tell you how I handle it as a, as a leader and an entrepreneur is I always have good operators around me. So, so Kelly Hodges, who was our COO uh, for, you know, some of the most magical years of mortgage coach and Kelly, if you watch this, I would just say, I had a really strong leader that was an operator that I um, empowered and I considered her my boss in many ways. Like, yes, I'm CEO of the business and I'm controlling the vision and everything, but, you know, having really good operators around me to, to make sure I don't do a good job. I'm definitely, I go in and out of that struggle on a personal level right now. And at this moment in time, I'm a little um, out of balance with chasing too many ideas and strategies and need to rein it in. Um, but I, I guess I'm humbled about it. You know, like I know it's not a strength and it's something that I'm, you know, just willing to think about. And when I get too frazzled and I'm not responding to emails and because I'm, I like to respond to everyone, even if it's someone that, you know, I, I got to say no to, you know, I like to respond to people. Um, but right now I'm a little out of balance and, you know, my advice is, if that's not your thing, have good people around you that are really good at that and empower them. Like, you know, let them manage those things and, and listen to them. Wow. Thank that was a, that. I, think, I think that was a great way to cap it off. Um, thank you so much, Dave. If you're not part of um, the Mortgage Coach Productivity Group on Facebook, it's still running, still active, right? Oh. Join yeah, the Facebook group. Whatever. Check it out. We'll have it in the, we'll have all the links in the description. Um, but the Facebook group, the YouTube channel, the net, it's Netflix for loan officers. I read. Yeah. Um, I, I like to say that. And by the way, guys, if you are watching this, we're trying to get to 20,000 this year. And I don't know what the exact number is, but I, it's over 19 and we're going to get there. But, but I am super proud of that, that YouTube channel. Uh, I do think it is a massive gift to the industry, to all new loan officers. Uh, I would urge you to subscribe to it, not for me, but for you. And, and, then, and then just watch one of those interviews with some of America's best loan officers. And, and just know that that same criteria, character first, like I interview people that are cool. Uh, and, and there have been some major ballers that do lots of business that I'll like, you know, not putting the priority around it, but right. I'm looking for people that are doing over hundred million in business and they're people that you want to hang out with and be friends with. And they're, they're character first, high producing advice, focused loan officers. Check it out. I love it. Awesome. And then at D Savage MC on Instagram, go give them a follow, check out some content there. Um, everything else we'll link down below, but thank you so much. Thank you guys. Thank hey, you, I love what you guys are doing out there in the world. And I'm proud of both of you, how much you've grown over the past few years. So keep doing what you're doing. Thank, Thank you so you. much. All right.